So, continuing on with our investigation of the property of aromaticity in compounds, after looking at frost diagrams and molecular orbital diagrams of what aromatic compounds might look like, we're going to see that we can come up with some rules that we might be able to apply as well. And there are really just two of them. The first rule is that uh, the molecule must have a continuous, that means unbroken, continuous um, ring of p orbitals that overlap. So it must be continuous, it must be in a ring, and they must be p orbitals. So that's our kind of our first criteria. This means in order for it to be a continuous ring, it's got to be planar or very close to planar. Um, because if it's not, we saw that by bumping up those uh, orbitals in the cyclooctatetraene, we don't get bonding happening here because now those orbitals are removed from each other. They can't overlap. Remember that overlap happens uh, when they kind of touch on the sides. If one of them is now up here, they can't touch on the sides anymore. So by doing that, uh, it's not allowing it to be aromatic, or in the case of cyclooctatetraene, anti-aromatic. So we have to have a continuous ring of p orbitals where electrons can delocalize. And second of all, uh, we also need to make sure that we have uh, all electrons, uh, actually, we can, uh, the yellow's right there. So all electrons uh, contribute to lowering the energy of the molecule. And why that one may be a little bit more obscure, we have a little way to cheat through this. We see there are things called Huckel numbers. Uh, which will tell us the number of electrons that can be aromatic or not. And we're going to see that anything with 4n pi electrons will be anti-aromatic, which is why our cyclobutadiene and cyclooctatetraene with 4 and 8 pi electrons respectively will be anti-aromatic. And if we were to do the uh, frost diagrams, we're going to see, yeah, because they have unpaired electrons in non-bonding orbitals. So not all the electrons are contributing to lowering the energy. And so uh, those would be anti-aromatic. However, if we have 4n plus 2 pi electrons, that's going to be an aromatic structure. So benzene with 6 pi electrons, where n is 1, essentially, 4 plus 2 is 6. So something with 10 pi electrons, with 2 pi electrons, these would be aromatic compounds. And we're going to see that uh, this is for, for, for rule number two. We're going to see if rule number one doesn't apply, then we will call this non-aromatic. So if you don't have a continuous ring of p orbitals overlapping, it's not an, it's not, it's non-aromatic, uh, which just means it's a regular molecule, right? Like um, just something that's not in a ring, something that is not continuous, or something that has um, non-planar characteristics. And we'll take a look at a couple of examples of those. For example, uh, if we have benzene missing a single bond, meaning we have a linear alkene, this is not a ring. So it can't be aromatic. So it's non-aromatic. If we have something like this, what's important to note here is because we don't have continuously alternating double and single bonds, this is an sp3 carbon. sp3 carbons do not have any p orbitals that can overlap. They're all hybridized. And so no p orbitals on a carbon, since it's, it's not 
there's no longer a ring then because there's no p orbital there. That means non aromatic. And of course, we saw in the case of the cyclooctatetraene with its uh, fun shape. Uh, let's see here. No, that's right, yeah. This one is not planar and therefore will be non aromatic. So when we're expecting something, to be aromatic, we have the two criteria. Does it have a continuous ring of p orbitals uh, that are able to delocalize together and their overlap? Second case, so if, if rule one doesn't apply, then it's non-aromatic. The second uh, criterion is that all electrons must lower the energy of the molecule. And our way of looking at that is we look at the number of electrons it has. Does it have 4n pi electrons or 4n plus 2 pi electrons? If it's got the 4n pi electrons, it's anti-aromatic. If it's 4n plus 2, it's aromatic. And so we can take a look at a bunch of different examples. We're going to see that uh, we might have something like this. This is called naphthalene. And let's uh, consider whether it is aromatic or not. Well, let's take a look at our criteria. First criterion is that we need to have a cyclic system uh, of p orbitals that are overlapping uh, and, and that is planar. Considering this molecule, we see that every single carbon here is sp2. sp2 carbons are planar, so planar is checked off. Do we have a continuous system, as in can this thing like resonate completely throughout itself? And it definitely can, right? We know we can resonate this molecule around, no problem there. We have alternating double and single bonds everywhere. So we have that, that criteria check. There's no unbroken conjugation, meaning there's no random sp3 carbons that are kind of blocking our progress. So, so far, so good. And now we have to count the number of pi electrons that we have. We have five pi bonds, which means we have 10 pi electrons. And if we consider that, that's going to be 4n plus 2, right? Because in this case, n can be 2, so 8 plus 2 electrons. So therefore, this should be aromatic. We're expecting naphthalene to be aromatic, and indeed it is. So, good thing there. What about something like... <laughs> This molecule. With ions, remember that ions allow us to get our p orbitals back. So remember that, that carbocations are always going to be sp2, right? Uh, so those would be planar. So we do have an empty p orbital there, so we can allow it to overlap. Let's consider whether this is going to be aromatic or not. So this is planar. Is it cyclic? Is, it, is everything part of a ring? Yes. Uh, do we have, uh, what was the other one? Um, the continuous p e orbitals? Yes, we do. Remember that a carbocation is an empty p orbital. So it's still a p orbital, so it counts. And so we need to now check, we have our criteria for the first part checked. Let's take a look at uh, whether or not uh, we have four pi electrons or four, um, four, four n plus two pi electrons. And indeed, we're going to see that we have two electrons here, zero electrons on the carbocation, and two electrons here. That's together four electrons.
So this thing is incredibly unstable. It's very unlikely that we will ever see this ion. And you might think to yourself, well, it's a carbocation that is resonance stabilized. Might be a good thing, but it's not. We really don't see uh, this ion ever forming because of the fact that it must be anti-aromatic. For example, if you take uh, this cyclopentadienol and try to react it with concentrated sulfuric acid to dehydrate it to form a carbocation intermediate, uh, you get no reaction happening. You can't dehydrate this. Because if you do, if you remove that OH as an OH as as water, right? If you have water as a leaving group, it's not going to happen because the anti-aromatic is something to be avoided at all costs, and so it's just going to hang around as a protonated alcohol. It's not going to leave because if it did, it would react right away again. Uh, because this molecule, being anti-aromatic, is incredibly unstable. We would expect a an allylic carbocation like this to be stabilized by resonance. But resonance is not an effective tool for predicting stability of aromatic or anti-aromatic compounds. So just note that the property of anti-aromaticity is a much bigger factor than resonance is. So just because it can resonate, that's a good thing, but because it's anti-aromatic, it's extra unstable. And so it's not going to uh, try and uh, lose it and become a carbocation like we might expect uh, other molecules to be able to do. So uh, anti-aromaticity is a much bigger factor than resonance. Same thing for aromaticity. Aromatic compounds are much more important than resonance is for the stability of the molecule. Uh, if we take a look at the same molecule but the anion version, remember anions are technically in sp3 orbitals, but they can rehybridize if it benefits the molecule. So one more thing to note here. So remember carbocation is always sp2. A carbanion can rehybridize if it can contribute to aromaticity. So normally uh, carbanions are in sp3 carbons, um, but they can rehybridize if it makes sense to do so. And so let's consider that if it were to rehybridize into a p orbital, we would meet all our criteria, planar, ring, and p orbitals everywhere. And now we have six pi electrons as a result. We'll have two from the lone pair and four from the lone from the um, double bonds. Overall, that's six pi electrons. Therefore, this molecule is aromatic. And we would see that it's actually very, very stable. Much more stabilized than we would expect resonance to do. A similar molecule that's not anti-aromatic, let's say cyclohexadiene, this thing has a pKa, or rather the, the corresponding hydrogen, has a pKa of about, I don't know, 48 or so. Really, really, really high. However, this cyclopentadiene pKa is about 16. That's roughly the pKa of water, right? Or of alcohols. This thing is extremely acidic because removing that proton allows it to become a lone pair, which can then make the molecule aromatic by removing that, that, uh, that hydrogen. So you see here, even though they're very similar molecules, the cyclopentadiene and cyclohexadiene, the pKa's tell us about the activity of that hydrogen. It's able to be abstracted by a base, leading to an anion, and that anion is able to participate in aromaticity.
So there's profound effects for the, the value of aromaticity. So even though the, uh, the one on the right, the cyclohexadiene, would be able to resonate as an anion, it's still not very stable. Resonance is a very minor component here compared to aromaticity. So normally, if, uh, um, you know, a, a carbon-hydrogen bond is a pK of about 50. So by making it allylic, we're lowering that a little bit. But making it to something that could be aromatic, we dramatically lower it. So much so that it's actually a stronger acid than many alcohols are. So uh, it's actually quite uh, a fascinating molecule, in my opinion. And so um, don't forget that all of these can uh, contribute to aromaticity. So we can have ions, we could have uh, neutral molecules, they could all potentially be aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic. And if you want, go ahead and do a frost diagram for these two molecules, and you should see that uh, as a result, the um, the uh, cyclopentadiene anion should be aromatic, and the cyclopentadiene cation should be anti-aromatic. So go ahead and do that on your own, and hopefully it'll all work out. You'll see. Uh, another reason or another a piece of evidence showing that the molecular orbitals also suggest uh, aromaticity for the negative one and anti for the positive one. In our next video, we'll look at the effect of heteroatoms uh, in aromatic structures.